Well, thank you. That's quite an introduction. I hope I can live up to that. Um, so yeah, the fun of programming. Um, programming is for me, it's always been something I really enjoyed doing. Whenever um, I saw this little magic box that could make sound and, and beeps and, and colors, I was mesmerized. And um, that, um, that obsession has uh, kept me going for, uh, for yeah, no, I'm 44, so that, that long. Um, um, and uh, I have focused a lot of my life on real-time graphics um, and by extension on user interfaces and then I mean uh, quite low level like building your own browser kind of low level um, and associated developer tools so code editors these kinds of things and over the last 20 years I founded companies to do things with these technologies that you create or that you work with so this is my first IDE. Um, it was Quick Basic. It came with DOS uh, back in the day when you uh, booted uh, from your floppy because hard drives you didn't have yet. Um, and it was amazing. Even by today's standards, especially by today's standards, it was amazing because you could almost in real time program. You pressed a button and it switched to the running program. And then you switched back and you can change the code and it switched to the running program. Much, much, much faster than we're used to today uh, outside of specialized solutions. And um, this was our aspirational goal that also came with DOS and uh, BASIC, which was gorillas.boss. Um, you're all probably very young, this is very old. Um, but you looked at the code for this game, you're like, how do they do this? How? You know, because it was all, um, there were barely any comments, if at all, and it was all giant lines, it was unformatted pretty much. So it was kind of impenetrable. Um, that was a bit of a sad thing, but it did give you an, um, a goal to aspire to. Um, so Quick Basic was very fast iteration. It was super easy to get into and learn. Um, it was actually a, a fairly safe high-level language that tons of terrible things, but um, ignore that part. But it was very limited. It was even at that time um, relatively far away from what you could do with the computer, even though um, Basic was... Uh, it was easy, it was slow. Um, so slightly later in life, this was when I was 10 or 12, uh, slightly later in life, um, I uh, had a guy at school and uh, he said, yeah, basic is dumb. And uh, here's a floppy with Turbo C++ 1.0 and you can't ask me questions. Now, go away. I was like, dumb? Okay, that's horrible, you know? That's like someone insulting your programming language that you're feeling proud of, that you were good at. I'm not saying this is good advice to do with people, but it worked on me at least. Um, and Turbo C 1.0 uh, is really, really old. This is like um, uh, C++ is a language that is surprisingly unfriendly to people. And um, it has pointers, it has null pointers, it has incorrect pointers, it has all sorts of memory issues that you can easily make mistakes with, especially when you came from basic and you had no idea how uh, a computer really worked, because BASIC didn't teach you that. And the worst of all, every time you made a, a null pointer or an error in your code, your computer would reboot. And your file might not have been saved to the disk. So you would reboot, go, oh, reboot. <sighs> I still have my file. But also it happened that your file was corrupted. So these are the stakes for making bugs by back in that day. And... Um, I don't know uh, if that's a, uh, uh, luckily today, uh, bugs and things are, are not as, as lethal, but uh, it did instill a proper sense of dread in me for uh, C++. Uh, memory at the time was very small, one megabyte uh, or maybe four. And uh, in, in real mode, uh, which, okay, forget about it, memory was chunked in, by in, in chunks of 64 kilobytes. You couldn't easily make a chunk of memory that was bigger than 64 kilobytes. Uh, this was called a segment, segmented memory model. And uh, that put lots of constraints on how you would write programs, right? You couldn't just make a buffer with stuff. L right now, people in JavaScript go, oh, here's 64 megs of something random in a list. Then you had to do it carefully in 64 kilobyte chunks. So when our current memory model, uh, protected mode, right, the sort of virtualized memory uh, stuff that works with pages, allowed you to, using 32-bit 30 addresses, all of a sudden get large chunks of memory. That was a huge step, right? It was a massive step. 
And um, then all of a sudden I was able to start to do, do things with, uh, with the programming language. Before it was all too limited for me. And because I was interested in graphics, um, you would do those on the CPU. So with that chunk of memory that you got, hopefully linear, um, you can write pixels. With the CPU, you can just loop over algorithms to draw lines or algorithms to fill triangles. Um, but it was very slow. And it was also very hard, because you couldn't just be stupid and write code that was you know, uh, just doing it the dumb way. That would never be fast enough. And you would always, uh, your code would always look crap compared to, I don't know, Doom or all these you know, really hardcore programmers. So it was, uh, was, not that, uh, was not that easy. So in 1996, I got my first GPU. Um, so back then, you only had the CPU and a flat chunk of pixels. But then we got a G the first GPU. And this was a revelation to me, because all of a sudden, I could send this thing vectors. I could send a triangle to this machine, and then it would fill it uh, with, um, um, with pixels for me. I didn't have to write the assembly code to fill a triangle with pixels. And that, to me, because yeah, I just wasn't good enough to do that at high performance, um, this all of a sudden made you on, put you on equal footing with the programmers of Quake. Right? You didn't have to do very many complicated things to make really amazing stuff come out of a, a GPU. So, you know, naturally lazy, I was like, wow, this is great. All I need to do is multiply matrices and apply textures. So this is the step from, for Quake at the time, going from pixels uh, on the CPU to uh, triangles on the GPU. And uh, um, so I've always been interested in uh, how to make things interactive, how to make things live, right? How to program it in a way that is has the shortest iteration cycle. Because especially when you're in the creative side of programming, having a fast feedback cycle is all the fun of it. So um, back in 97, um, I wrote a JIT compiler for mathematical well, functions, really. And I made them draw uh, in real time on the screen. So all of this is running on um, a 486, just to give you maybe, maybe 48600 megahertz or something. And um, all of a sudden, I could make sounds with equations. I could make these little pictures or height maps. So the creative side was really, really exposed by having all of this available real time. Took many years for this to, to appear elsewhere, but uh, you can find it now on your Apple as well, uh, although I think mine was still cooler with all the sliders and stuff. Um, and so I started my journey in building tools for creative process. How can we make this, um, this graphics environment more real-time, more fun, really? Because it's about fun playing with programming, fun playing with languages. And uh, this is one of my uh, early examples. As you can tell, um, all UIs in Windows are amazing. Just the functionality that you could pack into a UI like this, you'd struggle with the web browser, really, really struggle. This was a sequencer for playing sounds. Because uh, you know you could do that. That was fun. It even did audio scratching, so it feel like a virtual record. And then um, I started experimenting with also also 3D rendering using the same kind of uh, visual uh, editing components. So there was a flow graph that allows you to wire together a scene, a color picker. You know, it had a real time uh, 3D teapot. I don't know if you know the Utah teapot, but it's uh, just like this is computer graphics icon. So they always tried new rendering methods, and it was always with a teapot or the bunny. Um, but yeah, it was getting really fun. Uh, and this was all C++. I could finally access the performance of the computer. I wasn't stuck in basic anymore. I could do things. Um, and however, this is, this is not a programming language, right? This is a design tool. This is closer to a design tool where you like Photoshop or whatever, where you pick colors, where you change variables. This is not a programming environment. So um, I uh, decided to make a programming environment instead. Um, and here I took the, the real-time uh, 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 math uh, render engine and turned it into a, a programming language. And of course, I had no idea how to make a programming language or parse stuff. I just, you know, I just uh, made it up as I went along. So this is a data flow uh, language. It had all sorts of really weird features that were a really bad idea, but actually interesting to, uh, to uh, deal with. So one of the 
um, one of the features was that as soon as, as one of the flow graph nodes got referenced in the graph, it actually could call a function to update itself. So you could do all sorts of interesting fractally structures with that. Unfortunately, I missed that picture. But here you see uh, uh, the graphics rendering and you see the, the sounds that are also procedurally generated. Um, however, this UI was ugly. This was just like the old Windows UI. So um, from the design, I started into, okay, can we make UIs cooler? Because there was, back in the day, Winamp, you know, shiny v v visualizers, all sorts of custom Chrome. This was back in the day that applications tried really hard to not look like Windows applications. And um, it was a wonderful time. This, is, this UI is built all of out of panels. As you can see, I didn't... I wasn't able to make code editors yet, so I had to like transplant the old Windows UI in there because code editors were out, my, out of my reach. For some reason, I thought they were hard to build, and uh, they are actually relatively hard to build, but I couldn't do that yet. And then, uh, because I'm also building companies, we had a commercial contract for uh, Coca-Cola. I made a browser plugin that was a live video mixer and you could mix a Coca-Cola commercial with it, and then actually it was broadcast on MTV for a couple of months as their main commercial. So uh, this is absurdly complicated in terms of doing this in a web browser, because this was 2003. Um, but because I could run native code, ActiveX is a technology that is an exceptionally bad idea, but it was still available at the time. Um, it means that you can run binary code in a browser. Now, nowadays you go, what? The security implications of it is, are, you know, out of the window insane. But back then, you could do it because the internet wasn't so big yet. And I could run all my C++ in a browser, which was great, you know. I felt like a king. I could do everything. Um, also, I got live crash reports from, from all these people because, uh, you know, all that stuff that Google did with Chrome, that when it crashes, it, it dials home. It was already in here. Um, because C++ is like... Uh, juggling chainsaws, really. Like, it's horrible. It's one... Whenever somebody says that C++ is great, that's Stockholm Syndrome, right? <laughs> or, you know, don't talk to me, don't take my job, because it's great. No, it's not. It's terrible. It's one of the worst inventions of, uh, in programming ever. <laughs> so... Uh, but I still managed to get this, but then, yeah, if you made a memory error, how are you going to find it? Because, you know, you got to get a crash report from a user, so this thing did that as well. Um, but at this time, uh, you can see that I was just building a, a bad web browser, right? Um, I had a friend, uh, my business partner, a little later on, who was building UIs in a browser. And, and I was like, wow, you can do that in a browser? We, were, we, were, we had Visual Basic in a browser, Office in a browser, we did everything. And so I felt a little bit uh, outcompeted by the browsers, right? Because they had CSS. Whoa, you can style with style sheets. Whoa. Over here, I invented my own Photoshop ex export plugin that generated XML, and I used XBath as the styling engine, which is all really cool. But, you know, it's not a standard. Nobody understands it. You have to teach it. It, it, it was really great. I, I never approached this level of design integration from Photoshop to, uh, to a UI, and web completely didn't, because that's why we have HTML, people that hand convert Photoshop into HTML. Um, but it's still a bad web browser. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to leave C++ behind, because uh, you know, I had a really, I loved that language already, so that was not a big decision. Um, let's use HTML and JavaScript. And uh, JavaScript is great because it's like uh, it's a it's a language in a VM. You don't have memory errors, and as long as you don't do a lot, then it's actually quite fast. Um, so, 2006 to 2016, I did JavaScript and HTML, and I call this my decade of despair um, because. <coughs> That decision to go from, from, from C++, where you can do everything, to, to JavaScript, especially in 2006. I mean, this is the, the age of, what is it, uh, it uh, Netscape 4, right? IE, IE 4. That screenshot was in IE 4. Um, so that's really old web tech. Like, when people are complaining now about web tech, you go, oh, you know, your world is beautiful. Compared to back then, the browsers were so different that trying to match the CSS was almost impossible. But I believed in the distribution model, 
right? Just like this was a plugin that could load on anyone's computer, the distribution model of the web is amazing. You can give somebody your URL, and boom, your whole application is running, right? That is, that is something that native applications didn't have, because uh, you had platforms, right? You had different, you had Linux, Windows, Mac. Oh, back in the day, it was all Windows 99%, but still, platforms were coming in, and um, um, sending links was just beautiful. I really, really believed in, and still do, in the deployment platform of the browser. That is something that is, um, that really guided my motivation to stick it out. And uh, so, we were building UI tech, and at some point, uh, we figured out that we could build a code editor in HTML. And uh, that is also an exceptionally bad idea. <laughs> but as long as it goes fast enough, Nobody knows, nobody can tell, right? As long as your, your screen updates are fast enough, it's almost like it works. Yeah, except when you run a CPU profile, you go, no, it doesn't, but it doesn't matter. As long as nobody sees it, you have a code editor in the browser. And uh, so we built a company around that called Cloud9, um, which uh, we went to Silicon Valley, got venture capital, you know, played the whole startup game, it was really great. The code editor we made into a separate open source component and it went everywhere. GitHub, the early, early GitHub used it as its primary code editor. Khan Academy did, everyone used it. So um, it's useful to have done something like this because people then know your name and remember. Um, but I couldn't get there with HTML because I wanted to innovate. I don't want to have a dumb HTML code editor. I want to have the stuff that I just showed you. Live graphics programming, high performance, and none of this was available. So, um, effectively, I rage quit my own startup. Um, yeah. I was so pissed off at the browser and HTML. I felt like, you fooled me all these years. All these years. All these ways of years. So, at this moment, WebGL became available. And uh, I was like, maybe, maybe I can make this web thing that I focused on work, right? WebGL, great. WebGL um, is uh, essentially OpenGL ES2, um, and that is a, a, a graphics API that is, very, that is written for C and C++. And uh, it's, it's done by a standards organization, Kronos, so that means that it's a, it's a portable graphics API. It, run, it runs on all platforms, generally. I mean, let's not go into details, but that's the general idea. And WebGL was an idea from someone at Mozilla to just transplant that API straight into JavaScript, which is an exceptionally bad idea. Um, especially Google people were really pissed off about that because this API is not Webby at all. Like, Webby is high level, it has nice JavaScript -y APIs. This was literally pushing arrays into a state machine. Right? This is not a web API. Google had O3D at the time, which they is more like a browser DOM engine, like HTML. It's very conceptually similar, and they worked on it really, really hard, and they lost anyway. So uh, what I do credit Google with is that uh, at w when they realized that it was going to be WebGL, they put massive engineering effort in actually making this safe. Because WebGL exposes uh, essentially a very low-level API that's not designed for safety at all. So running shader code through WebGL on your GPU is a tremendous uh, hellhole of security issues, right? You can have a million buffer overflows in your NVIDIA or whatever video driver that is also not designed to be secure. These things are not designed to have code pushed from the web straight to the driver. It, it was a complete nightmare. So Google made a, uh, Angle which is uh, essentially an abstraction layer that implements WebGL onto all the native graphics APIs like uh, Direct3D um, and uh, Metal and all these, all these backends. Um, and because then they could put a security layer in between and analyze the code as it goes through. And uh, yeah, I do find, because if you look at the scale of that project, it's tremendous. It's an enormous amount of work and it costs an enormous, a lot of money to build, but they did it. Um, so I had new hope. I had new hope that uh, now I could do stuff again in a browser because I got the GPU acceleration back that I've always wanted. And uh, so I made, I made MakePad uh, JavaScript. MakePad is the name that I found for, uh, for the creative uh, application that I wanted to build. I wanted to build an IDE 
a design tool hybrid where uh, whatever you did, you can uh, see if this still works. Uh, you can live change the color. What is it doing? So you can see that these are a lot of elements, right? And it's interactive with the mouse. You don't want to try this with HTML. Um, let's see. Here we go, a little fractal tree. This actually runs on your iPhone 6. It's pretty old already, so. Um, you can run this, it runs nice 60 frames a second. Um, and it, um, let's see. It allowed me to do all sorts of nice experiments because JavaScript is a dynamic language, right? That means uh, types are uh, determined at runtime, and in this case, you can also hot reload it. So uh, let's see if I can show that example. Uh, so this is a reactive little UI framework that is implemented in something like 500 lines of code. Um, it, it even contains its own parsers. Uh, this was actually a university uh, uh, project, or uh, sorry, a university assignment uh, from a friend of mine at the University of Amsterdam. And I was like, you know what? I never finished my university degree. He was like, let's see if I could do your, uh, do your, uh, do your assignment. So uh, in, in about two days, uh, I did it. And it was really, really fun. Um, because this level of interactive, let's see if I can show you. You sold, did you sell your house? Here we go. Did you sell your house? So this is live coding. So every single thing in this in this in this JavaScript thing, uh, JavaScript application is live codable, uh, and you can just see um, it updates. Let me see if I can show you some. So here we have some sliders. This is a slider, um, and then you know we make the slider a bit smaller, make a bit more of them, make it even smaller. smaller. Let's make some more of them. <laughs> and then uh, let's randomize them. Let's redraw them. Uh, maybe a bit too many. There we go. Oh, wait. This is also the top of the page. This is like the whole thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, performance I got, right? This is great. I, ha I finally have my performance. I have it running in a browser. This is running web workers, multi-threaded, um, because, uh, so here's the sliders uh, moving. And as you can see, there's not a single frame lost whilst this thing runs in a worker thread regenerating. So hold on, maybe I can even dock it in a split way. So the performance is there in these computers, right? You just need to access it. Um, let's see. But, you know, I keep going. I, my whole life is a chain of exceptionally bad ideas. Um, <laughs> this was great, right? It was fast and everything. And I had a, a friend of mine in the games industry. He's like, wow, you made a UI, wow. Can it do anything else? And I was like, well, I'm running at like 99% CPU to do all this, and it's great, and it's running 60 frames a second. And he was like, yeah, but now what? You know, can, you, can you render a large, complex data set? I'm like, well, no, I can't access memory in, in the browser. I only have four gigs. So, oh, well, can you now uh, use it as an as a, as a editor for a game? Well, no, I can't download all the textures. So I, I ran into this wall where I'm like, well, I made something really cool that looks great in a demo. But the actual use cases where I need this performance were still shut off from me in the browser. I don't have the RAM, I don't have the data, I don't have the network. So, um, yeah, that was really depressing. Also because uh, the browser started crashing after I was live coding in it for about half an hour. The JavaScript engine just was like, <laughs> gone. So, um, yeah, cool, great, you know. I spent seven years of my life doing that finding, or whatever, six, doing uh, JavaScript, trying to make this thing work. And uh, along came Rust. Uh, my current co-founder, Eddie, worked at Mozilla, and Rust is a new programming language that came out of Mozilla to rebuild their browser engine. And Rust is a new language, or new, it's been around for a little while now. But essentially, it's C++ without the chainsaws. So you get the performance of C++, 
without the memory errors. And uh, memory errors are one of the most dreadful bugs for programmers because a value is just not what you think. Like something, there's garbage in your data, right? And garbage in your data causes your, uh, your code to go everywhere. You have no idea what's happening. And then you have to find where something modified that data, right? There are many, many reasons for memory corruption. It could be use after free. So you delete it, you, you freed a piece of memory, but you're still using it. And now that memory isn't used by something else. And that something else then cor gets corrupted. So in C++, you often have a case of um, what the fuck, right? <laughs> what the fuck is wrong now? Oh, sorry. What the beep is wrong. <laughs> and then you have to go think about where in the world could uh, this have gone wrong? Um, and if you are, and you have lots of tools to deal with these kinds of errors now as well. Back in the old days, you had no tools. You had just had your own brain. Um, but you have tools now to find these things. But I would prefer not to have to find them at all, especially not when you're making a product, when you're in a, on a customer's computer. Um, and so Rust gives you the performance of C++ with safety. And actually, um, I, I also learned that a type system is incredibly important here. This is something, because I was in JavaScript, everything was weakly typed, I could do anything I wanted. Um, I never truly understood what a type system was. I thought C++ was typed. T C++ is not typed, it's like JavaScript with memory errors. Um, it is weak, it's very, very, very weakly typed, because the moment you start learning types, you start seeing that types actually constrain, constrain, uh, can, um, constrain the possible state space of your application. And when you learn to deal with memory and state in an application, you realize that reducing the possibilities of incorrect state is actually a great path to high quality software, right? Like if you have two variables and those two variables are, are connected, right? They, they can only be in a state together then in Rust, you can often put them in an enum, or you can use a type to constrain that they can never actually be independently set. So you don't have um, errors, uh, states or state space errors as much as uh, you can constrain it with types. But that does mean, uh, in a way, that Rust is fairly hard to learn. Like types are a way of thinking. And it's, it's fairly rigid. You need to do it up front. It, it's not a thing you do after. You can, there are languages that allow you to do delayed typing, but Rust is not one of them. Um, and because it has a memory model that is uh, garbage collector free, I don't know. So in, in languages, when you have memory, um, garbage collected languages actually allow you to not care. And uh, every now and again, the, the VM just looks at all your memory and see if there's bubbles that are not referenced anymore, and then it can throw those out and, and free the memory. So you never have to free the memory, memory manually. Rust has a borrow checker and does compile time man memory management. And that is a constraint that, that requires you to think differently, and that is one of the hardest things. So, you know, great, now we have performance. So now what we can do, what can we do? And uh, um, when I, uh, I don't know where that was again, but I saw an, like an MSX computer, very old, uh, when I was 10 years old or something, and it was rendering a Mandelbrot fractal, which took a whole of a minute or two minutes for just a very, very low res image. So this image would take like a minute or two minutes to draw. And uh, that, that also was mesmerizing, but just to give you an idea, what happens if you, uh, if you, run that now natively in Rust, you get something like this. Let's see. Right, so this is running on 10 cores on all the available compute uh, in real time in 4K or whatever the resolution, on my MacBook screen it's in 4K. And it also runs at 120 hertz. So all of a sudden, you know, we get, we get that magical computer we've dreamed of. Because if you do this in JavaScript, it's not going to look the same. It's not the same. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah. So here you can see all the tiles spiraling out. It's running on a, a multi-threaded. Uh, this is great about Rust as well. You can just use threads properly. Rust has 
safe multithreading, which is really weird for some people, but you can actually use multithreading fearlessly. I think they call this fearless concurrency. Um, let's see. And uh, why did I now? Also, yeah, I, I made my own uh, presenting software. I always do that because <laughs> if you're into graphics, you like, and you have to use Keynote, that's like, nah. I have to use Keynote, nah. So uh, um, another another thing that is that is that requires a lot of performance is a synthesizer, right? So. Um, we built a synthesizer. This is a little example. This is our example application, just to see if the UI stack and IDE does something useful in this case. You can see. Let's see. This actually runs in your browser, and you can load it up as well. This is uh, the same Rust application running as WebAssembly. And it's a bit older version because I didn't update it. I keep forgetting passwords from my virtual machines. Um, but uh, the, uh, the synthesizer here, let's see if I can make it do anything. Oh no, my clear, bu my clear button is gone. I need to work with my designer now. I can't clear it anymore. Either way, um, this also runs on an Android native. It runs on web, WebAssembly. It runs on all platforms, Windows, Mac, Linux, natively. And um, this makes Rust the only language I know of that is so versatile that you can do these things in, in, all, these, all, the, in all these platforms at this high level of performance. Um, and yeah, this... this so I didn't talk much about that, but uh, we kind of rebuilt the entire UI stack from the pixel on up. So this is a new way to render user interfaces. It's using uh, shaders. Those are little programs that run on the GPU. Uh, so every single uh, UI element in this, in this UI is essentially a little program that runs in parallel for every pixel. And uh, it's kind of my answer to CSS. So instead of running uh, on, a, on a vector engine that is parameterized with color and border radius and stuff, this engine is parameterized by, sh by programs. And the programs actually compose uh, in linear inheritance. Um, so it's, it's pretty neat, but I'm not going to go into too much detail there. But uh, it's pretty far out in that sense. So probably a really bad idea. Um, here's the synthesizer. And yeah, so uh, you know, I was building IDEs. Um, this is the old version of the IDE that uh, I made. Uh, it's already three years old. We've been rebuilding the new one. The new one is going to be spectacularly nicer. Um, but this is already pretty nice. This is a um, this is the code. This is actually the IDE that I use every day myself. So I wrote my own IDE. Uh, dog fooding is the only way to know if you're sane. Um, but it can do this. It can do animated code folding. And uh, that means, like, you know, it can just minimize code. Um, and it also has uh, real-time um, real code editing here. For instance, this is a little fractal tree. Um, and in the code here, there's variables. And these variables are just directly exposed to, um, to the UI, but they're they're, they're dual direction, so you can you can write it in code, and you can manipulate it using um, using um, sliders or editor elements. And this was uh, this was quite hard because this was one of my engineering challenges, right? Can you build a UI stack for creative coding for live coding and build everything, the IDE, the UI, the engine, the, the widgets, the styling, every single bit. Um, and uh, this one actually runs in WebXR as well. So this little tree looks kind of quaint here in this way, but on a quest you can walk around it and brush the leaves with your hand. It's not a joke, actually true. Um, so yeah, we, we finally uh, got there. I finally got there with Rust, WebAssembly, finally got there to the point where I can now build 
applications that are fun, I can build tooling that actually scales, right? Like, um, uh, shall I show a profile? I don't know, maybe it's, this is too developer nerdy to see. Let's see, developers. I mean, if you're a web developer, you know this thing. Let's see how bad it is. Profile. Ah, okay, that's not good. Oh, wait. How many milliseconds do I have per frame? Oh, yeah, it's running 120 hertz on my, on my computer. So this is actually 120 hertz, this, the fragment of 120 hertz. So I, I got to have to get used to that. My uh, frame time is a little bit bigger as part of the frame because I get not, no longer get 60 frames a second, but I get 120. So it's almost using, I don't know, 10% of the frame... Uh, what is it? Uh, allowance I have for 120 hertz. So this would technically run at about 1,000 frames a second if your GPU can keep up. So yeah, performance matters for fun programming. That's uh, that's my message, really. Um, in Rust, you can do these things, and um, that all of a sudden opens up a huge amount of possibilities that we didn't have when using JavaScript or uh, other languages that are just not high, so high performance. And our goal is, so this is our little, this is our test application. And we're building an IDE that allows you to edit this just like a Figma document. So this UI is actually designed as a Figma document. I have to just build the UI designer that splats it out into a giant design view. But all the components and all the states and all the inheritance structures that are behind it uh, are very similar to how Figma would do this. So this is our vision of merging design with programming in a way that uh, that scales, uh, because uh, you know it, it, uh, maybe this is a good idea. Uh, yeah, so I do want to uh, end on uh, a little bit more complicated note. So uh, you know, I was feeling really good about myself, like, oh, cool, it's starting to work, it's almost done, we almost have a live IDE. And then GPT-3 happened, you're like, oh, cool, you can now do some really basic code generation. You know, I barely registered on my radar as, uh, as important. It's like, oh, okay, sure. However, I think last week, GPT-4 dropped. And you're like, ooh, damn. You know, the amount of complexity that this thing can already generate compared to GPT-3 is an order of magnitude better. Right? I think most of you probably have uh, seen uh, people have discussions with GPT-4. Um, it even seems to have a sense of... Uh, I saw some, some things go by about uh, imagining someone's feelings. So you can say, hey, this person is in this context. This happens. How would you think this person feels about that? And you get a real answer. Okay. So... Uh, GPT-4, if you look from GPT-3 to GPT-3.5 and 4, if you look at the curve, it's an exponential. And exponentials are really scary in that sense. They are, um, because now, you know, we, we are fine. Like, GPT-4, cool, we, we can integrate that, right? We'll, we'll train, uh, we'll do, uh, what is it, um, one-shot learning. We'll, we'll make a document that describes our languages, our DSL, our Rust APIs, and we can one-shot learn it on GPT-4. And then we can build it into our IDE so you can prompt it to say, hey, you know, could you design me this widget or could you do explain this API to me? You know, that is a doable, that's a doable step. We can do that. The problem is, six months later, there's GPT-5. And this is a very, very big unknown because ever since last month, I found that my ability to predict technology and where it's headed, and that it feels like a wall has been slammed one, one month ahead in my life. And that is, as a technologist who loves to spend a decade on building stuff, it's a very strange experience. Um, short term, it's fantastic, right? Short term, you know, people have get a digital assistant, you know, offices automated, we get Excel sheets generated for us, we can uh, ha learn many things, because it's a private tutor that is better than anything I've ever seen. It can explain APIs, it can generate basic, um, what is it? It can generate basic um, plumbing code that you really don't want to do. Um, however, 
What can you do then? Well, you can only maximally accelerate with the models, right? This is why right now for my company, it was like scramble. How can we as quickly as possible accelerate our own development and the development of people using our, our, our tool? Um, and, as, and again, it is exponential. So can you imagine what twice or whatever, four times, we don't, I don't know the exact curve of the exponential, but what three times GPT-4 can do, it's, it's you know, it, I, I don't know, I have no idea. But the problem that is underlying all of this is that there is now a process going on that is commoditization of intelligence. And if you don't know what commoditization means, it means that the relative value of something drops to the common level. It's common, right? You don't, there's no value add in, uh, or less and less value add in intelligence. And that is something I, because, you know, this hit me uh, when I was uh, said yes to this talk, I had no idea, I was oblivious. I was like, yay, this is all fun programming. This hit me last week and I was like, Okay, I'm going to throw this into this room because this stuff is going to, especially if you're in tech, in programming, this stuff is going to hit every single one of you in completely unknown ways. So um, I would like to open the room to ideas of, given this, um, new abilities that you get, right? What kind of abilities do you think you can make use of? And at what point do these abilities become a threat to your relative position, right? Like you learned a lot of stuff. Hey, ChatGPT, generate me a high performance database engine. Okay. That's not an unbelievable future, right? So um, um, what, yeah, what, what opportunities do you see in this context and how can we exploit them? This is something that, um, I think a lot of people on Twitter are also thinking about. If you haven't seen it, you should go see the interview of Lex Fridman with um, the CEO of, uh, of OpenAI, because it's very um, interesting, but also he essentially explains that OpenAI is societal therapy to prepare what is coming next. I thought, wow, that's, that, thank you, now I feel a lot better. Um, I know it's, it, it's not a very clear question, but uh, yeah, I would like to see if anybody wants to add to the discussion, have questions about it, and see uh, yeah, if we can have a forum about it a little bit. All right, Rick, so we have unfortunately already run out of time. Really? So, yeah. Damn it! <laughs> I was like, but, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have all this time available now. But we do have a, have a suggestion for you, because this is, of course, an incredibly valuable uh, discussion to have. I mean, that particular podcast episode, I have it downloaded on my phone. So, you oh, know, it's, uh, it's definitely so one that, that I would recommend also in a discussion that's worth having. So yeah. our suggestion is to find Rick during the coffee break uh, and continue that conversation with him at that time. All right. Well, thank you.